Hey, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, and welcome to this session of the Math Machine Learning Seminar in PIMIS and UCLA. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome David Stutz as our speaker. Um, David is finishing his PhD at the MPI for Informatics in Saarbrücken, uh, supervised by Bernd Schiele and Matthias Hein from Tübingen. Um, so David has uh, done um, very interesting work uh, on uh, adversarial robustness with robustness through flatness that he's going to be telling us about. And um, I very much look forward to, to his presentation. So David, please. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Thanks again for, for inviting me. I'm uh, looking forward to, to having the talk and of course for uh, any comments and questions and a bit of discussion. So yeah, as introduced, um, I'm with the Max Planck Institute for Informatics. I'm supervised by Matthias Hein and Bernd Schiele. Matthias is currently with the University of Tübingen and I am here to talk about um, adversarial robustness or so robustness against adversarial examples um, uh, and then rate robustness, which is kind of less studied, I would say, in the community and trying to relate these two concepts through, um, through what I call or what um, the community calls flatness. Um, and I hope you also can see the cursor, which um, I'll use every now and then. So this is um, a short outline of the talk. I'll start with a brief motivation, um, high-level motivation, giving you a bit of background on adversarial robustness, adversarial examples for those that, that are not familiar with these concepts. And then I'll basically have three bigger parts. Um, I first want to talk a bit about defending against adversarial examples where adversarial training is, I guess, becoming the state of the art. And I want to talk about um, a variant called confidence calibrated adversarial training that we worked on nearly two years ago. And then I'll switch gears a bit talking about uh, robustness in the weight space, specifically um, uh, against bit errors in quantized models. And finally, I'll try to kind of combine both a bit and try to argue why um, uh, considering both robustness in the input space and rate space might actually be beneficial. And this is uh, my latest work from, from ICCV two weeks ago, um, where I'll try to show that weight robustness can actually improve robustness against adversarial examples. Um, just as a short reference, so this is kind of work spanning my whole PhD essentially. And if you're interested in, in the full texts, um, uh, please visit the web, web page. You can, of course, also just text me or ask uh, at the end. Um, so let's start with a short motivation. In general, um, as, as long as possible, feel free to, to interrupt me if something's unclear. Um, uh, but of course, we can also have the questions at the end, however you prefer. So um, that's probably no news, right? Deep learning has had a tremendous impact on um, the AI applications we are seeing, uh, seeing in, in recent years. Um, most of you will be familiar with all of these examples, be it autonomous driving, machine translation, or kind of the very highly publicized uh, advances by DeepMind, so AlphaGo, AlphaStar, AlphaZero, um, AlphaFold more recently. Um, and this progress, of course, has led to um, an increasing interest in topics um, that relate to trustworthy deep learning or trustworthy machine learning in general. So may it be security, interpretability is of course a big topic in for, especially for deep learning, privacy, fairness. And while some of these topics obviously have been studied um, on their own, so in, in the kind of non-AI realms like security and privacy, um, I think the, the, the research um, specifically to AI or deep learning has only begun couple of years ago. And I want to talk about specifically about uh, security in the context of deep learning. Um, and the main focus of the talk will be adversarial examples, um, which were kind of discovered or rediscovered depending on, on which story you follow around 214, 215. And by now there exist kind of a lot of different flavors, but in general, the idea is that you have very small perturbations or changes of your examples, in this case, for example, images that cause misclassification. So the easiest case on the left here, you'll see that these are MNIST digits where you have very small perturbations. So you have a bit of background noise and suddenly the model basically misclassifies all of these examples, right? But you have different variants. You, you can have patches. You can have, I, I hope that you can see that these kind of few pixel borders here that seem very random, right? But kind of have the same effect. And people also started printing these textures, for example, on t-shirts to avoid detection or on classes to be misclassified. It's a, it's a bit pixelized, but um, the researcher here is um, recognized as Jennifer Lopez, right? Um, so this is just an idea 
of uh, what different um, types of adversarial examples exist. And um, all of these, so I will focus mostly on in the computer vision domain, but adversarial examples can be found for text, for speech, for tabular data, and so on. And I think adversarial examples also sparked a lot of interest in related security issues that I'll briefly touch on in a couple of slides. Um, so before I want to go into details about adversarial examples, I briefly want to make clear why I find it interesting to study and to research adversarial examples. And there's, of course, the first reason, which is the obvious security concern, right? And in my opinion, this is a concern that is relevant for nearly all domains and settings that we are talking about, especially, of course, if we are talking about autonomous driving, robots, medical imaging, and so on. But even if you say or you're convinced that in your application, these adversarial examples or related security concerns are less likely or less relevant, then I still believe that from a machine learning perspective, adversarial examples are very interesting to study because adversarial examples basically show that there is still kind of an alignment problem between kind of human intelligence and, and state-of-the-art AI. So um, all the systems that we thought of beating human performance, right, we know that on ImageNet and a lot of other tasks, there have been studies showing that that the AI is um, at least at the same level, if not better than, than humans. But these ad adversarial examples simply show that that's not true, right? So we are kind of following maybe this, the, the wrong metric or the wrong picture. Adversarial examples have, are a simple counter example that um, AI is still lacking a lot with respect to um, its human counterpart. And then of course, mathematically, you can also think of adversarial examples as just kind of a smoothness violation, right? So usually we assume that our models um, uh, are more or less smooth. We assume kind of small input variations cause small output variations. And again, adversarial examples are a clear counter example of that, right? Where small input variation causes a huge um, change in, in the prediction or the output. Um, so I believe that these phenomena are very important to, to understand and will likely also lead to kind of improved uh, machine learning and deep learning um, models in the end. So um, after I hope I, I convinced you why it's interesting to study adversarial examples, let's briefly um, get into details and, and formalize them. So generally, adversarial examples can be thought of as um, or can be obtained by maximizing the cross-entropy loss in order to cause misclassification. Here, the cross-entropy loss is, of course, a surrogate loss, right? So there are kind of plenty of attacks that um, do it differently. But for this talk, I think that's a very, very easy to understand picture. Um, and then what we essentially want to do, we have given an image X, for example, this panda from the famous Goodfellow paper. We want to find a specific perturbation delta. This is, of course, magnified here, um, such that the, the addition, so X plus delta, the, the adversarial example, is misclassified. I think in the original paper, it's misclassified as a given. And we do this just by solving this maximization problem where we maximize the cross entropy loss between the adversarial example and the true label. And usually, we constrain the perturbation in order to prevent the perturbation to be so significant that we actually make the image unrecognizable or truly change its crown tooth label. And um, in, in early years and today, uh, still today, the most common model is probably an LP constrained uh, perturbation, for example, at infinity or L2. And this is also usually called the threat model in combination with the fact that we allow the attacker to actually access the weights, right? So we can solve the left-hand optimization problem using, for example, uh, gradient descent or gradient ascent um, by computing gradients, and we constrain the perturbation in its LP norm. Um, and these are also often called the imperceptible types of adversarial examples because the noise is usually so small that as human, uh, it doesn't really matter or you can't really see it. But as I said, there are patches, there are frames, there are physical printed, there are adversarial examples in for semantic segmentation in the 3D realm and so on. And I think the important bottom line here is that in all of these cases, all of these different adversarial examples are able to reduce the accuracy of your favorite state of the art model more or less to 0%. Of course, there are um, variants, there are more, more stronger attacks and weaker attacks, but um, they, they are a big problem, I would say, in all domains and across all tasks and models. Um, so just to highlight where we are on the bigger map, I already said that there is um, 
um, going to be a lot of work on, on various different security related problems um, in the ML pipeline. I will mostly talk about evasion attacks. So adversarial examples are in the security literature usually, usually called evasion attacks because you can evade classification or evade detection. And later I will talk a bit about weight perturbations, but you can see there are a lot more problems. And in my opinion, all of these are interesting for both the security region and, and um, from understanding the models that we work with. So just to uh, sum David, up, uh, uh, yeah. just briefly, can you just say again, uh, what is the type of attacks that you are going to consider? Um, so I will, so in the talk, I will mostly consider really uh, these types of attacks. So the attacks are not necessarily always um, 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 obtained by maximizing the percent entropy loss, but they will always be constrained by the LP, usually the L infinity norm. Right. And they will be but... white box attacks. Yeah. Uh, white box. Okay, so that means yeah, you, yeah, sorry. You, you know the entire network and the, the parameters. Exactly, exactly. That's a good point. Um, that's why I, what I try to highlight here. So I will consider white box attacks, which basically just means that the attacker has access to the model. So we can solve this problem, for example, by computing gradients and doing gradient descent. Um, in the evaluation later, I, I can maybe highlight it if I remember. Um, I will also consider black box attacks, but um, um, the white box attack is usually the, the stronger notion. Got yeah, it. thanks, and, thanks and for the comment. Yeah, then you mentioned, uh, uh, you talked about evasion attacks. Uh, you maybe clarify what that, what that means? Yeah, exactly. So evasion attacks are essentially what you would call adversarial examples in the machine learning domain, in the security domain, you would call it evasion attacks because you try to evade uh, classification by the classifier or detection by the classifier. Um, and this is, I think, just a naming convention from security because in security, even um, not considering um, AI in general, you have different types of evasion attacks where you want to evade certain systems. So I'm not too familiar with the security um, aspects there, but this is why it's, uh, so this is a paper in, in the from security domain from CISPA, as far as I remember. Um, and there, they usually call it evasion attack. I hope that clarified it a bit. Yeah, perfect. Um, OK, so the main point to take away here, what I will focus on most, is these um, standard adversarial examples in quotation marks, which are meant to be imperceptible. We want to have a perturbation that causes misclassification. And the reasons why I want to talk about that to you is uh, both from the security aspect and also uh, that it demonstrates simply a lack of understanding. We have these deep models, we assume that they perform well, but these adversarial examples just show us that we don't understand them as well as we thought, and they don't perform as well as we thought. Okay, so let me get started with kind of the first uh, part of the talk um, about confidence play by the adversarial training. And this is mostly also to give you an understanding of um, what we can do to defend against these adversarial attacks, um, and that it's still a very difficult problem. So what is a defense, right? So a defense is basically a method, a procedure, a training algorithm, a post-processing step, whatever, in order to make the model adversarially robust, right? So to make it harder to find adversarial examples, or in the ideal case, to make it impossible to find adversarial examples. And here I borrowed a nice plot from Nicholas Collini, who is tracking the work on, so the papers on adversarial examples on his webpage. And you can see that around 218, it, it really exploded a bit. And this is just to illustrate that there is so much work in this area that I, I can hardly uh, identify the main, the main directions in, in defending against adversarial examples anymore. So I, I won't even try in this talk, but um, I think the main two lines of work where a lot of papers seem to be concentrating around in the last one or two years are adversarial training on the left. This is what I will mainly talk about. This is an empirical approach. So we, will, we won't have any mathematical or statistical guarantees on the robustness that we obtain. But I also briefly want to mention, in case that's interesting for some people here, that there is also a lot of work on certified defenses or neural network verification, where the goal is really to get some sort of mathematical or statistical guarantees of how robust the model you have um, is or can be. So I will focus on the adversarial training part. And um, in layman terms, adversarial training is basically training on adversarial examples, which are generated on the fly. Uh, formally, this is usually implemented as a min-max optimization problem. So you have uh, in the uh, inner maximization problem is basically computing adversarial examples. So you can think about during training, in each iteration, we compute adversarial examples for the mini batch that we, uh, that we currently want to train on. And then training basically tries to minimize this worst case 
cross entropy loss, right? That's why it's a min max problem. And uh, it's maybe important to, to realize that by minimizing the cross entropy loss on adversarial examples, we are basically telling the model that uh, it should correctly classify all possible adversarial examples with high confidence, right? And this is also illustrated down here. Maybe I, I go back. Um, if we think about an L-infinity thread model where we, we have perturbations that are constrained by this L-infinity norm, the task is not correctly classifying the dots, but the task becomes correctly classifying these squares around the uh, dots, which contain all possible adversarial examples. And you can easily see by the difference between the, the gray and the red line that the task might actually get significantly harder than standard um, classification. Okay, so let me illustrate how this looks in practice. Um, so um, uh, on the left, I basically show the confidence in two classes, the true class in blue and the potentially adversarial class in pink. And I plot this confidence along an adversarial direction in input space, right? So I sample an adversarial direction and I plot the confidence along this direction in the input space. You can see that here, uh, the model was trained on L infinity adversarial examples that are constrained using an epsilon of 0.03, which um, is actually quite small, but it's still a very difficult task. And you can see that um, the adversarially trained model correctly predicts the true class, the true blue class here with very high confidence, as long as we stay within this epsilon ball of 0.03. As soon as we go beyond that, however, you can see that we again can very easily find an adversarial example, right? Where the um, confidence in the adversarial class increases at some point exceeding the blue class and causing misclassification. The same holds on the right here, uh, where we consider, for example, an L2 attack. Um, and again, you can find an adversarial example, meaning the adversarial confidence is very high, um, very easily. Yeah. Okay, David, uh, here, uh, this, is, uh, this is for uh, a single direction that is uh, identified by the exactly. attacker? Exactly. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, in practice, you can imagine we, we compute an adversarial example, right, um, which can be seen here. And then you basically plot the, the confidence in those two classes from starting at the, at the test example uh, until the adversarial example and even a bit beyond, right, to, to obtain this plot. Uh, I, I hope that that was clear enough. Um, okay, so the main message here is that even though adversarial training is able to obtain some robustness against the adversarial examples that we trained on, right, which are constrained to the epsilon ball of 0.03 in the infinity norm, um, it does not necessarily generalize to other attacks like other threat models or larger perturbations, right? Which is of course a problem in practice because only being robust to a specific type of episodic examples might not be super useful in practice. Yeah, just to clarify, so in the, in the right-hand side, yeah. this is also trained with uh, L infinity. Uh, exactly. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the same model as on the left. It's just at test time, we compute L infinity at early examples instead of an, um, L2 at early examples instead of L infinity ones. And so on the x-axis, you also have the L2 norm here. Yeah. But so, but the L2 perturbation here, um, is it, uh, how, how would this L2 perturbation compare uh, with the L infinity? So is this kind of um, optically comparable or is it much, much worse or, or, or what? That's, so that's a, that's a good question. So in generally, of course, if you have an L2 norm of 0.5, if you put all of this difference in one pixel, then the L infinity norm would also be 0.5, right? So obviously the L2 and the L infinity norm do overlap, but not exactly. Um, in terms of uh, visually, uh, I'm sorry that I don't have examples. Visually, because the L infinity norm here is so small and an, an L2 norm of 0.5 for 32 by 32 color pixels is also pretty small. So we are on SVHN here now. Um, you wouldn't actually be able to recognize it. Right, so if you have the the clean image and the adversarial example side by side, and you really can zoom in, you might be able to tell that there is a difference. But usually, the difference is very small, and if you just look at it, you wouldn't be able to see it in both cases. Right, both on the left and the right. Okay, so the idea. Um, so, so the problem, uh, just to just to repeat again, the problem is of course that we would like to have kind of a more holistic type of robustness that generalizes not only to the episode examples that we see during training, but also kind of other episode examples that we might encounter in test, test time. Um, so our idea here was to um, and avoid enforcing high confidence on adversarial examples and actually train the network to reduce its confidence on adversarial examples that it sees during training 
And this is shown here. So this is actually a real model um, illustrating how it works. So you see that the larger the perturbation here, the model very quickly resorts to a uniform distribution where all classes, so again on SVHN, all 10 classes obtain um, the, the same probability, right? And the hope is of course, that this would extrapolate um, automatically beyond the, uh, the epsilon ball of 0.03 because extrapolating a uniform distribution might just be more meaningful um, compared to always predicting high confidence. And I just want to highlight how we exactly do it before showing some results. So in confidence clarity at result training, it's basically two steps. The first step is the training step. And now it's the same framework as at result training. We again compute at result examples, but um, instead of enforcing high confidence on these at result examples, just by minimizing the cross entropy loss, we now pick a new target distribution that we want to enforce, that we want the network to predict. And this target distribution is illustrated here, right? So without a perturbation at zero, we still want the network to predict the correct class with high confidence at clue. But as soon as the network, um, sorry, as soon as the perturbation gets larger, we want the model actually to reduce its confidence significantly, uh, ideally to uniform confidence. And again, uh, we hope that this is extrapolated, right? And in practice, this is just done using a cross entropy loss and basically sampling this curve here according to the perturbation that the adversarial example that we just computed has. And then at test time, uh, if everything works, the model actually uh, produces low confidence on adversarial examples. And then we want to kind of reject them using a confidence threshold. So this is illustrated on the left. This is the ideal behavior of the network as shown in the, in the previous slide. And then we can pick an appropriate confidence threshold and hope that we can reject all the adversarial examples that we compute at test time. And this actually- Can I ask pretty... uh, what is the gray curve here? Oh, sorry, the gray curve is essentially all other classes, right? So we have the true class in blue and all other, for example, nine classes, if we have a 10 class problem are plotted in gray. Um, uh, they because are we have on top of each other, basically, they are on top of each other. Yeah, that's maybe we should have put a legend. Yeah, exactly. And what, what happens when you fall below the confidence threshold? So you basically say, I cannot make a prediction, or what exactly? So the rejection is basically the model telling us that um, it's either uncertain or it doesn't want to make a prediction. And I'll get to that in a, in a second. The, the task at test time is, of course, calibrating this confidence threshold in a manner that we still have good performance on clean examples, but we get um, very good robustness on it as early examples as well, right? Um, okay. And then on the right, I, I briefly illustrate that this actually works pretty well in, in practice. So this is after training, we compute adversarial examples on the test set. And this is kind of a confidence histogram over all the computed adversarial examples. And you see on the left that most of these adversarial examples actually receive very low confidence. So if the confidence threshold is high enough, we can simply reject them and then they don't pose a problem anymore, right? You see that we still have some adversarial examples, but because robustness is a hard task, um, um, this is this is kind of not surprising that there are still some adversarial examples that go through. I mean, here it seems that you're rejecting a lot of the examples, right? So I mean, but in that case, it would as well say I'm going to reject everything. And uh, so yes, exactly, yeah. But um, so uh, let me um, maybe explain in detail. Um, before I get to the results. So the confidence threshold obviously applies to both adversarial examples and clean examples. What I'm plotting here is only the adversarial examples. So ideally we want to reject all adversarial examples, but obviously if we put the threshold very high, we will reject more and more clean examples that we don't want to reject, right? Because we reject if we reject clean examples, then the model basically makes a lot of errors. So if we think about rejecting uh, as more or less equal to not making a prediction or even predicting the wrong label, then we want to avoid rejecting um, true labels. So what I plot here is only the adversarial examples, um, but uh, maybe to, to foreshadow that a bit, what we do in practice is we, we choose this threshold in order to make sure that we reject at most 1% of the correctly classified clean examples, right? So this confidence threshold is chosen purely on the clean examples. We don't need adversarial examples to calibrate it. So we have this 1% that we potentially reject from the clean examples. And in exchange, I will show that we get quite a bit of robustness, right? So, but this, I mean, this histogram, you could also interpret it actually almost as actually classifying the examples as clean or uh, adversarially perturbed, right? Because I mean- Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think- You can view um, it that way. 
Yeah, I had a related question. Maybe it's related, maybe not. Yep. Can you can you please repeat um, what do you actually mean when you say reject? Ah, so reject. So you you would you would think about it in a two stage process, right? So you have the model making a prediction. The model makes a class prediction and a confidence prediction, right? So the confidence is just the maximum predicted probability. And then if this confidence is below your threshold, you basically don't make a prediction, right? So the model basically tells you, I'm uncertain. I don't want to make a prediction and you reject them, right? And it, of course, depends on how you want to evaluate it. We picked a very simple evaluation where we said that if we reject, for example, a clean example, that's not what we want to have, right? Rejecting a clean example is bad because on a clean example, the model usually performs very well. So it would be better for the model to make a uh, prediction on the clean example. But if in exchange for that, we can reject most of the FSL examples, we can, of course, kind of improve robustness quite a bit because FSL examples do not end up fooling the model, right? Because fooling the model means that the model actually accepts the, the doesn't reject the example and makes the wrong prediction, right? I hope that was a bit clear. I heard Not someone in between. Yeah. Was somebody else um, saying something in between? I'm not sure. No, okay. Um, yeah, we can. I can also go into more. I have a couple of backup slides with really the details. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't anticipate the, this detailed questions at this point, but I'm uh, yeah, happy to answer them, of course. Um, Okay, so that's the idea. And um, what I want to show here is that now with this confidence threshold, so this is actually not illustrative here. So the 0.6 is the confidence threshold for this model that we actually chose based on the clean examples, as I explained before. And you can see that the model does indeed extrapolate this low confidence prediction beyond the, the FSL examples that we see during training, right? So on the left are the FSL examples that we train on, and on the right are FSL examples that are allowed to have a larger perturbation. So this means basically that the robustness that we obtain by rejecting episodic examples generalizes to these larger perturbations. The same goes for example for L2 episodic examples. Again, you can see the model uh, results very quickly to the uniform prediction, right? And we can basically uh, reject these episodic examples as well. Um, and the same holds actually for a lot of different attacks. So we tried L1, L0, and FSL patches, FSL frames, and so on. I don't have plots for all of them, but I'm going to summarize the results in the next slide. So um, yeah, just to show some of the results, this is kind of the performance um, on this, the FSL examples that we see during training. And here I also, uh, it maybe gets clear what I mean. So we compute the robust test error. The robust test error is the test error on FSL examples. Lower is better or lower is more robust. You can see that FSL training, so robustness is far from being solved, right? So FSL training still gets a 56% robust test error. Um, and we compute the threshold now in order to obtain a 99% repositive rate. And that's what I said earlier. We want to reject at most 1% of the correctly classified clean examples, right? So that's how we choose the confidence threshold. And of course, for adversarial training, we allow adversarial training to make use of the same mechanism. But for adversarial training, the improvement is usually um, uh, very little. And then um, the, main, the main kind of target of this work is essentially evaluation on unseen attacks, right? So these are various unseen attacks larger L infinity ones, L2, L1, and L0 ones with different um, LP balls. And the main point here is that adversarial training uh, is not robust to most of these attacks, right? So with a robust test error, uh, very close to 100%. And our confidence scale at adversarial training actually performs quite a bit better. Um, as I said, robustness is not solved yet, but um, the robustness that we obtain on the seen adversarial examples generalizes very well to the unseen ones. The same holds on Cypher 10. On Cypher 10, you'll see that the, the performance on the L infinity adversarial examples is generally uh, a bit lower, but you see on the L2, L1, and L0 adversarial examples, um, it's significantly uh, better than the baseline, right? And as I said before, this generalizes to a lot of attacks. So if somebody's interested, we can go over some of the backup slides, but we did experiments on our distribution data, on corrupted examples, on adversarial patches, adversarial frames, and so on. And we can show that the, the robustness generalizes quite well. Um, besides that, what I also didn't show is that we can improve the clean accuracy, so the accuracy on clean examples a bit, which is usually a big problem for episode training because, well, the, hard, the task gets harder, so the increase in robustness is usually paid for by a decrease in the clean accuracy. Okay. So this was confidence calibrated episode training. I hope kind of it give, gave you an impression that kind of episode robustness is a difficult task. 
there are a lot of different approaches out there. And um, a particular difficult task is coming up actually with strategies or models that give you robustness that generalize very well to attacks that you can't foresee, right? So attacks are, of course, developed further. So we don't know which attacks um, uh, the model will face tomorrow. And so we need models that generalize further. Uh, now I want to switch gears a bit, talk about bit error robustness, specifically in the weight. So this is not robustness with respect to perturbations in the input space, but in the weight space. And this seems um, uh, less relevant um, at a first glance because attackers usually don't have access um, to, the, uh, to the weights, right? Of course, in adversarial examples, we often assume this white box case where this is actually true, but this is just because this is a stronger attack model. So if you want to have a fair evaluation, you assume that. But in practice, there are not a lot of scenarios where attackers can directly manipulate weights, right? Um, nevertheless, there are quite a few applications where this is relevant. Um, in the interest of time, because the, the confidence calculated training part was a bit longer, um, I'll skip discussing these in details. Uh, the left-hand side, so this is actually a backdooring um, application. Uh, if anyone's interested in that, um, please ask me later. Um, but there are actually also applications, for example, in quantization, because quantization inherently in introduces errors, right? Because we want to save bits. And nowadays, we are kind of working with two, three, or four bits or even binary networks. Um, and so robustness in the weight space is of course beneficial here if we want to kind of work with quantization. Um, and this also leads us to uh, the, the application that I want to talk about uh, specifically in DNN accelerators. And because I'm, I don't have a hardware background and I assume a lot of you might um, not have too, I'll quickly introduce what DNN accelerators actually are. So an accelerator is basically a specialized chip, a specialized piece of hardware, uh, which concentrates just on inference, right? So we don't want to train on these chips. We just want to make the forward pass uh, on these chips. And they look sometimes similar to a GPU, right? So on the right here, you have an array of processing elements, which do kind of all the basic operations. And similar to a GPU, then the forward pass can be run in a highly parallelized fashion. Um, and then on the left, and I, I won't go to, into all the details of the components, but we usually have a hierarchy of memory with the most important part actually being the off-ship DRAM here, because that's the biggest part of the memory. And this usually stores the weights of our model, right? So usually, I mean, state-of-the-art models have millions of millions, if not, not, not more weights. And even if we quantize them to 8-bit to 4-bit, we need pretty big memory to hold them. So the problem is that the energy consumption of these accelerators is dominated by accessing the weights, right? Because for each forward pass, if we have a feed forward model, we need, of course, kind of load the weights, do computation with the weights, and then kind of write the, the intermediate activations, read the intermediate activations from the previous layer, and so on. And this kind of reading and writing takes up most of the energy consumption. And this is because accessing the DRAM, which is usually off-ship, is way more expensive than working with any local register or buffer of the chip. So what people started doing is they reduced the supply voltage of the chip, specifically of the memory. Um, so this is actually real data from a chip um, where we don't have a DRAM, but we have SRAM, which is uh, um, from the hardware side a bit different, but I won't go into detail here. I also don't know all the details, to be honest. But these are actually a profile chip. You can see that the energy consumption per SRAM access, if we want to access one bit, um, goes down as soon as we reduce the voltage. Both are normalized by Vmin, so we, um, I don't know the absolute numbers here, but Vmin is basically the minimum voltage that we can use for error-free operation. This would basically be the, the nominal voltage that the, the manufacturer usually re, um, recommends. The problem is that as we do so, we inject bit errors in the memory, right? So the memory becomes unreliable. And this is illustrated here. So these maps show for each pixel, each pixel is one bit. And yellow bits or yellow pixels basically illustrate a very high probability of this bit flipping by accident. So you read the wrong bit. And this, of course, has direct impact on the weights that we store in the memory. And you can see that the rate of these bit errors increases quite dramatically for lower voltage. And if you actually measure this for a real chip, what you'll commonly find is that the bit error rate here in blue actually increases exponentially. Right. So on the on the on the left y-axis here, we have a log axis, right? So the lower the voltage, the higher the bit error rate. So why is that a problem? This is a problem because we store the weights in a quantized fashion on the memory, and each bit flip has some impact on the weight value. So we have basically perturbations in the weights, and these perturbations in the weights might of course impact um, the performance of the model, right? Because we change, we actually change each bit flip 
directly changes the model, changes the output function. And um, just to illustrate how severe this can be, this is a 8-bit quantized model on Cypher 10. We have the test error or kind of the robust test error, so the test error with bit errors on the y-axis and the bit error rate on the x-axis. You can see that even for very small bit error rates of 0.1%, the test error already increases quite significantly. Um, and be beyond that, we, we are in regimes where the model is not really interesting for, for practical use anymore, right? And the goal is, of course, to reduce, to lower this curve. Um, so what we did in this work is we kind of looked at actually profiled chips and we came up um, with kind of, or we extracted a very simple model, which is just kind of uniformly random bit errors. Um, so this means uniformly at random spatially um, across the, the memory. And we kind of map the weights linearly to the memory. And we want to improve robustness against these bit errors then. And um, we did this in three steps. Um, but um, in the interest of time, I will just focus on the middle one because it will be uh, also relevant later. So, um, uh, which, which is weight clipping, and I'll kind of directly start with that. So, what is weight clipping? Um, weight clipping is basically a regularization scheme where we want to constrain the weights to a very small range, which is minus W max W max here during training. Um, and this can really be small. So, I'll have an example later where for a ResNet, this can be as low as 0 0.005, right? So, you can constrain the weights to minus 0 0.005 and 0 0.05 for. Um, a ResNet 18, for example. Uh, and this is in practice just achieved. So it's very simple to implement. It's just achieved by projecting all weights back onto this range after each um, SGD update, right? And another thing that is important to realize is that the relative errors of of, of bit errors, so the, 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 the value error that bit errors inject relative to the weight range does actually not change if we just reduce W max, right? So this doesn't kind of trivially give you any robustness. Um, and I just want to illustrate um, how this looks in practice. So I'll start on the right. You have on the top a normally trained model. You see that the weights are in between, let's say, minus 1 and 0 0.5. And on the bottom, you have the clipped model, where we clip the weights to minus 0 0.1 and 0 0.1. Um, and then on the left, I basically showed a logic distribution, right? We showed a log logic distribution for the clean weights in blue and for the weights after injecting bit errors in red. You can see that for the normal model, the distribution of the logic changes significantly, especially we don't have any logits up here anymore, which are usually those logits for the true class, right? Because in a true class, we usually expect larger logits. So after the softmax, we have a high probability in the true class. As a result, this model is makes a lot of mistakes after injecting bit errors. We can see here the average confidence reduces quite a bit and the confidence histogram also looks different. And I will have some, some um, results in percentage on the next slide. For clipping, so as soon as we train with clipping, this looks very different. You First you see that the, the logic range is more or less the same, but now the distribution kind of with bit errors and without bit errors is very similar, right? So bit errors just have um, less impact on the model. And so it also has less impact on the confidences and on the classification we do. So um, this is just an example. So um, AirQuant is our robust quantization scheme, which I didn't talk about in detail. Um, and if we have 1% bit error rate, we still have a test error of 32%, right? So the clean test error is 4 point something. And then as soon as we inject bit errors, this goes up to 32, which is of course unacceptable for most applications. Now, if we just train with clipping, here we have a W max of 0.15, this can be reduced significantly to 13%. The question is of course, why does clipping work so well? And our hypothesis is that it's a combination of limiting the weights and minimizing cross entropy loss because cross entropy loss ideally wants to uh, wants to kind of force the model to predict very high logits, right? Um, so I saw a paper recently where they actually kind of wrote that down and actually showed that, uh, which I think is, is very intuitive, that um, minimizing cross entropy loss ideally um, leads to kind of a, a logit of infinity for the true class, right? So we have this goal of large logits, but at the same time, we are limiting the weights. Usually if I go back, what the model can do is it can identify useful features and put large weights on these features to obtain large logits, right? As soon as we constrain the weights, that's not possible anymore. So the only option the model has is to achieve large logits through weight redundancy, right? It has to use more weights for the same task, so more weights for the same features, for example, um, to obtain large logits. And this weight redundancy actually improves um, the robustness against weight perturbations. And just as a, as a simple example, as a simple counter example, as soon as we take away 
this goal of large logits by training with label smoothing, we actually can, the test error actually goes up quite significantly, right? So if, if we don't have this need for large logits while uh, clipping the weights to a small range, then we, we don't gain any robustness. Uh, I do this whole... a question in the chat. Um, so I'm going to oh, read sorry. it. Sorry. Uh, no worries. When you say project, yeah, have... you mean if a weight exceeds W max, you set it to equal W max, or do you exactly do a more exactly projection? Mm -hmm. No, that's exactly the same. So um, oh, there's a chat. Let's open the chat for the future. Yes, exactly. So um, it really means um, projecting back onto this range, which because it's a uh, it's an interval, you can just do this by by clamping, right, by clipping, uh, which is kind of a one liner in in PyTorch and TensorFlow and so on. Exactly. Um, okay. So here I kind of showed the impact of that. You can see that we all, we, so Brown is with robust quantization, which I didn't talk about. The main point here is the blue line. And you can see that even for larger bit error rates, like 1%, we are now at least below 8% robust test error, right? So 8% is of course still doubling the test error, but we, at least we are in a regime where the test error is um, interesting for applications. Um, and then we can combine this with random bit error training. I didn't go into detail in that, on that either. The idea is to inject bit errors during training to improve robustness. And I just want to highlight the overall story as we do that. The effect that it has is that we can actually, like this, this lower robust test error directly translates to an energy consumption, uh, to an energy reduction, right? So for 0.5% bit error rate, this is roughly a 30% energy reduction, right? So the energy reduction, the energy consumption of the whole accelerator is reduced by 30%, or most of it is reduced by 30% at a cost of roughly 2% in the test error. So that's the main point to, to take away here. Um, yeah, so as I said in the paper, we also focus uh, a lot on the quantization. Uh, we have a follow-up paper where we also consider bit errors in the inputs and the activations because they also go through the memory. Um, and we also consider the adversarial case. So what if an attacker through, for example, a row hammer attack or something injects bit errors adversarially, but I, I won't go into detail here. Okay, so this is basically one yeah. question from the chat. Um, so I'm going to read uh, again, it. Again, sorry, yeah. So, uh, I, I can read it. Give me, oh, a, give me a second. Right. Um, yeah, so error correction. So the question is, um, could we do some sort of error correction on the most important bits? Um, and the second question is, does the network size impact things? Two very good questions um, that we also explored in, in the paper. So the, the error correction point, um, this is... Um, so this was also new to me, but we had, um, this was actually a collaboration with IBM. So we had experts there. And the main point about error correction is that most of the error correction codes you have either incur a lot of overhead because you need to store a lot of parity bits, for example. If you just take standard error correcting codes, for example, with one parity bit, then you can at most correct one bit flip per word, right? The problem is that in most state-of-the-art memories, a word is usually 64 bits or more, right? So if you have a four or eight bit quantization, you have multiple weight values per word, right? And if you have now a bit error rate of, for example, 1%, then in most cases, you have way more than one bit error per word, right? So in this case, error correction codes are not really kind of applicable. And those that are applicable need a lot more additional memory. Uh, which also results in additional energy consumption, right? The second point, network size impact things, um, generally not. So we did experiments with roughly the same architectures, um, uh, bigger and smaller and so on. All of our analysis is done relative. So we, we, we speak about kind of a bit error rate relative to the number of bits um, used for a network. Um, and we also found that um, it doesn't really matter that much whether you use kind of a ResNet or write ResNet and so on. So the architecture is not too important here. I hope that that answers both questions. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's great. I think I'm just trying to get my head around it. Is it in some sense to think of this noise in some sense as multiplic multiplicative on the bits itself? Because I don't know, in yeah. my head it seems like as soon as you add some form of additive noise, it'll have like a CLT effect and you'd expect things to kind of wash out over time. But if yeah. it's noise on the bits, then it's multiplicative. And so you don't release. And that's why as the network size increases, you'd still have the same issues kind of coming through. Exactly, exactly. Hardware. Because okay. exactly from the hardware point, you can imagine that if we have a bigger model, we just have an additional memory array, right? But the voltage is what determines the bit error rate. And as long as the voltage stays the same, doesn't matter how many memory arrays you have, you will have the same bit error rate in the end. 
Yeah. And another thing maybe to think about it is, um, so the impact of a bit error on the actual value is also non-trivial, right? Because it strongly depends on the quantization. So maybe a, a simple analogy to think about it is that this is actually L0 noise, right? So it's not comparable to L to Gaussian noise or to L infinity noise or something like that. Yeah, good point, thanks. Um, okay, a lot of questions. So I might um, skip one of the, uh, some of the parts um, in the next section. The next section is basically motivated by some findings on weight clipping. That's also why I focused on weight clipping before. And we basically wanted to link back weight robustness to input robustness, specifically at reserve robustness. And we do this through um, a concept called flatness, which I'll kind of introduce in a bit. So just to, to recapitulate, um, the motivation of this work is that we realized that weight clipping does not only help against bit errors, it also helps against L infinity weight perturbations or L2 weight perturbations. So it's a very general type of robustness that we obtain. Here, this is shown for L infinity. Again, you have a relative L infinity perturbation. It's relative to the, so the, to the range of the weights, right? So if the, the range of the weights gets larger, the L infinity ball also gets larger. You can see that the model trained with clipping in orange just has a low robust test error for higher perturbations compared to the normal model in red. Um, and so we thought about was, what is rate robustness actually? So what, how can we think about rate robustness? And um, I remember these um, works in 2017 to 16 about flatness, linking flatness in the loss surface to generalization performance. And uh, if you think about it, weight robustness is essentially a quantification of flatness. Because what does weight robustness mean? Weight robustness means that if we have some perturbation, eta here, then the expected loss under this perturbation, for example, this can be random perturbations or adversarial perturbations, the expected loss is very close to the loss without perturbation, right? And if you take this together, this is basically what uh, quantifies how flat you are in your loss landscape around the weights W that you found. And here I borrowed the figure from Heska et al. Where on the left, you can see you have a flat minimum. And you can see if I now take steps to the left or the right, so very small steps, the loss doesn't change too much. If I have a sharp minimum, then even small steps will have a huge impact on loss. Yeah, definition of weight robustness. Could I explain that one more time? I don't have a definition now. I will have um, an, a more exact definition in a couple of slides to define the flatness measure. For now, you can think, for example, about L2 perturbations in the weight space, but you can also think about bit errors or L0 perturbations, right? The notion is the same. Um, if we have small perturbations of whatever type, we want the loss to change only slightly. I get to that in a second, and if it's not clear, then uh, please interrupt me again. Um, so why is weight clipping relevant for adversarial uh, robustness? And here I take one step back and want to kind of look at this nice training plot of adversarial training, where you see now the robustness. So I hope it's not too confusing here. It's, of course, robustness against adversarial examples again. So adversarial robustness, the higher, the less robust we are, because that's the cross entropy loss on adversarial examples. You see that during training, the the training loss actually reduces as we would expect, but we have a severe overfitting problem, right? So around 40% of training, the, the loss on the test examples increases again. And we found that if we now just add weight clipping, and here I said, right, so we can really do extreme weight clipping for these resonance here, then this is mitigated to some extent, right? And the question is, so why does weight, if, if weight clipping helps to mitigate overfitting, um, is there kind of a stronger relationship? And this is kind of the hypothesis of this work is basically um, we, we think that flat minima, which is kind of a notion of rate robustness, in my opinion, um, can improve robust generalization and the right robust overfitting. And so what I'm going to do first is actually define what I mean by flatness. And this is kind of coming to the, to the question in the chat that we have um, a bit clarity on, on what I'm talking about. And then in the end, I just have a lot of experiments that hopefully illustrate that um, weight robustness or flatness is actually beneficial for robustness against adversarial examples. Um, so let's start with an illustration. How do we measure flatness? Um, again, we start at the weights that we found after minimization, and we just compute the robust loss here. The robust loss means the loss on adversarial examples. And then we do the same after adding a weight perturbation. And here, what we do is we define a local neighborhood B, and within this local neighborhood, we want basically to sample or to optimize, um, the, uh, maximize the robust loss, right? So we have some perturbation within this neighborhood and we compute the robust loss with these perturbed weights. And then we define the flatness 
as the difference between the loss with perturbed weights and without perturbed weights. So now finally coming to the exact definition, this is what we call flatness, right? So you can see on the left, we have an expectation over weight perturbation sampled from this neighborhood. I'll talk about the neighborhood in a second. And then we, for each of this perturbation, we evaluate the robust loss, right? To, in order to evaluate the robust loss, we need to compute adversarial examples, which we do using the inner maximization problem. And then we subtract the, what I call reference, a robust loss. The reference robust loss is of course important because if we want to compare this flatness measure across models, we need to take into account that different models might have different um, adversarial robustness to start with. And the important part I think that um, should answer the, the question in the chat is how do we define this neighborhood, right? So what's our, our, um, our um, perturbation model? And the perturbation model is an L2 model. So we allow L2 perturbations, but not in an absolute sense, uh, rather we define the L2 perturbations relative, right? By C relative to the absolute L2 norm of the weights for each layer, right? So we know that different layers have different weight distributions. So we want to do, we want to define this neighborhood on a layer-wise basis. And because we have, diff uh, because different models and different training procedures can lead to different ranges or different magnitudes of the weights, we want to define this epsilon or uh, this, uh, this neighborhood B relative to the absolute norm of the weights. Okay, so why is this kind of scale invariant and this kind of relative definition of the neighborhood important? Think about a network, a very simple MLP, for example, a ReLU network, and you can think about scaling up the weights. You can scale up or down the weights, and if you do it in the right way, you actually keep the output unchanged, right? So the network is invariant to specific scaling operations in its weight. But the loss surface, of course, changes, and this is illustrated here, so this um, is supposed to be the same network, but once you scale the weights um, up, for example, or down, and once you um, scale, them, uh, scale them up, and then, of course, it looks sharper on the right-hand side. And what we want to do with this neighborhood B, we, of course, want the neighborhood B to scale with the weights, right? So the neighborhood B should get larger if the weights get larger and smaller if the weights get smaller. And this basically ensures that we can compare this flatness measure across models. Okay, so first we looked at robustness um, at, the, at the flatness through our training. So here again, we have the plot from earlier where you see that we are severely overfitting. And in red, we plot the flatness measure that I just introduced. And this is just sampling 10 random weight perturbations and then kind of averaging over them and then subtracting the reference robust loss. And you can see as soon as we start overfitting, the, uh, the flatness actually gets, uh, gets up. So here it's important to know, so if we go back, um, then a lower value of this flatness measure means that we have a flat minimum, right? A larger value means that we have a sharper minimum. So if we go back here, we see the, the value goes up, which means that during overfitting, we converge to a, a very sharp minimum, right? We can also visualize that slightly different just for illustrative purposes. We have the test loss, the robustness on the y-axis and the flatness on the x-axis. And uh, we do this, across training. So the blue epochs are the early epochs and the red ones are late ones. And you can see around epoch 50 or 60 here, we start overfitting, right? So the robustness, the, the robust loss increases. And along that, at the same time, also we converge to sharper minimum because the flatness value increases. And you see that this relationship is nearly linear. And we can now do this across a lot of different methods. Um, regularizers, in the interest of time, I'll just highlight the latter two. So this is adversarial training with adversarial weight perturbations, which is a recent approach to avoid robust overfitting. This is adversarial training with additional unlabeled data. And you can see that both of these approaches not only uh, improve the robustness on the y-axis, so we converge to more robust models, but we also avoid converging to sharp minima on the x-axis. And this is also reflected in the robust test error that we measure at test time, right? So we end up with more robust models. Um, this can be confirmed across hyperparameters. Um, so if you look, for example, at trades or ATAWP, we try different hyperparameters of these methods and we plotted again the robustness against the flatness. And you can see that those hyperparameters that uh, obtain better robustness also obtain better flatness. And this is, of course, highlighted by the regression lines, the, the dotted regression lines. So finally, we did that across a lot of models. So we have a lot of regularization schemes here, label noise, label smoothing, weight clipping as introduced before. We have different adversarial training variants, MART, trades, ATAWP, um, if, if people are familiar with those. And again, we basically plot them on the same axes. 
you see that a regression line shows a very strong correlation. If you compute the Pearson correlation coefficient across these models, it's actually very high, or 0.85. You clearly see that the models that are we know that are very robust, like ATAWP, for example, down here, it also finds a flatter minimum. And at the same time, if we have, for example, an optimizer like or a regularization scheme like weight clipping or entropy SGD that explicitly favor flatness in the loss landscape, as soon as we combine them with episode training, we can not only improve the flatness, but also robustness. Um, and very briefly, um, this also works um, if we not consider the absolute robustness, but the robust generalization gap, which we compute as the difference between the robustness at te on test examples and on training examples, right? Again, you see if we have flatter minima, so model that, models that find flatter minima have a lower robust generalization gap. The same on the right holds if we quantify the degree of robust overfitting by subtracting the, um, the best robust loss from the last one, right? This difference is of course high if we have a lot of overfitting and models that avoid overfitting also converge to flatter minima. In the interest of time, I'll skip that. I'll just say that you can have alternative formulations of this flatness measure. You can, of course, instead of averaging across random directions in weight space, you can also have an adversarial notion, a worst case notion of flatness. Okay, I think we are we are pretty close to the 50 minutes anyway, or even above that. Um, uh, in summary, essentially, what, what this work is supposed to show is that weight robustness, which we reinterpreted in, in this framework of flatness, um, actually helps to understand the robust overfitting. And if we find ways to improve flatness or to converge to flatter minima, we not only avoid robust overfitting, but we also um, uh, generalize way better. So the robust generalization improves. Okay, so to sum everything up and maybe put it in, into one big picture at the end. So I started out with adversarial examples and adversarial robustness. I showed you that even within adversarial robustness, it's very difficult to have a general notion of robustness, right? Robustness against multiple types of adversarial examples, against corrupted examples, adversarial patches, and so on. And our confidence carried by adversarial training was basically a first step into that direction. And then I switched gears talking about rate robustness. Um, I know that this is quite a bit different because it has this setting, this hardware setting of DNN accelerators. But I mean, in general, what we are interested in is models that are robust against perturbations in the weight space. In this setting, it has the nice benefit of actually saving energy, which is a very tangible uh, benefit in my opinion. But if we put both together, we can actually show that this weight robustness, if we reinterpret it in terms of flatness, um, it actually quantifies the, the overfitting that we see, the robust overfitting. And as soon as we kind of find methods that uh, favor flatness and favor flat minima, we can improve robust generalization and um, improve robustness against adversarial examples. Um, so that's a rough overview. Again, you can find the papers and more on my webpage. Um, and yeah, uh, if there are any other questions, comments, we already had a lot of questions, so thanks for that. But of course, if you have any other questions, um, Please go ahead. Thank you very much, David, um, for this um, very uh, complete, uh, or maybe not complete, but uh, uh, you know, lots, lots of different topics on, on your work yeah. uh, about robustness. Uh, so this has been uh, very, very insightful and, and different, uh, interesting um, parts of, of this problem.